I'm going to follow up on Dr. Warren Duke's uh, thoughts, and it was good to have that introduction because I'm not going to talk again about the experimental design too much. I'm going to try to follow up on the specific results that we have. So uh, I'll start, and then uh, Dr. Steve Como will follow, and then Dr. Christine Spronger. So we are going to talk about stratification, the role of roots and yield trends after 60 years of no-till. So we already saw some of the results that we got since the beginning. We are going to try to focus more in these late years after more than 50 years uh, of those treatments. But when we talk about stratification, we already saw some of the results, but I'm going to go back a little bit and try to uh, reflect a little bit more on the stratification uh, that we get when we have tillage systems. Uh, and these are two images here of soil profiles that are not from that experiment, but will be helpful to understand. So what is the stratification? It's basically this gradient that we have on soils from the top until the bottom, and generally is ca characterized by greater soil organic matter in the top. and it depends on the soil type and where the soil is, it, it will change below that. But on the top surface, most ecosystems will have this greater soil organic matter. And why is that? It's basically because above the soil there, there will be the plants, and the plants use sunlight to produce photosynthesis, to produce their carbohydrates, and when they die, they will uh, add the residue on the top surface, and that's what, uh, over the time, build up this darker color that's basically organic matter that's being added year after year. Uh, and if we think about nature and how it evolved over the years and millions and millions of years, we can see that there are other things that benefit from this behavior of having greater organic matter on the surface. And if we think about the plant roots and also about the organisms, they will be mostly in this top layer. And why? Why we can find more microorganisms, different kinds of organisms, and also most of the roots are in those first couple inches of the soil, obviously, that there are more roots and organisms deeper in the soil profile, but most of them will be in the top surface. And that's because there is where they can find water, or at least more easily find water, but also oxygen and nutrients. So this is in a natural ecosystem. And this uh, pattern will benefit most plant roots and soil organisms. So they co-evolve through like millions of years, and that's where they can get most of the oxygen, water, and nutrients in natural ecosystems. So we are changing crops, we are now changing microorganisms, but they still rely on oxygen and water, and they know that by the environmental changes that they feel in soil, that's where they can get the most of it. And in cropping systems, we'll focus mostly on the down to 8 to 16 inches. Uh, these profiles go a little bit deeper than that. And this stratification has allowed nature to thrive. So everywhere where we look at natural ecosystems, there is this stratification patterns to different degrees, uh, but we'll often find most of the roots and organisms in the first couple inches of the soil. And later, Christine will talk a little bit more about the roots on these systems. And if we think about the idea of those experiments, how can we maintain? So is it stratification a bad thing or a good thing? If we look to nature, nature is saying, well, we are still working well for like years and years and years, and there is this stratification of the soil profile. But if we want to develop this pattern on agricultural systems, things that we can do, mostly reduce tillage, uh, add organic matter above and below ground. So after we harvest, the amount of residues that we leave in the soil that will help build, it, build up this organic matter in the, in the top soil. And also how we place the fertilizer. If we put the fertilizer deeper in the soil or in a shallow depth, that will affect the stratification. So if we put nutrients uh, at greater depths, that will 
change this stratification pattern that's not that natural. Uh, but it also follows the rate, but also how we will be adding these uh, nutrients. So if we add closer to the soil surface, we will increase the concentrations of nutrients in this top couple inches, depending on where you place the fertilizer. And they will go down uh, with time, so with the water, with leaching. And if we put the fertilizer too deep, we increase the risk of losing the fertilizer because if they go deep, they will also continue to go deep in the soil profile. And we, there's a greater risk because they, there's not as much roots over there and there's not as much organism that could use that and bring them to the top surface where the roots. So soil stratification is not a new thing. I brought up here this fact sheet, uh, a mini review. I know that later I knew that the speaker will be here, Dr. Grove. So there is more information into that and it's available. Uh, so if you wanna check a little bit more into that. We are gonna focus in two specific research questions that we had. So uh, on top of those research questions that started the experiment to begin with. And we are gonna evaluate how the long term, so more than 50 years of those treatments affect this, uh, the stratification of soil physical, chemical, and biological properties. But also another question that we were really interested in is how the crop rotation, does the crop rotation will change this stratification pattern within the tillage system? So that's another question that we had and we are gonna try to explore a little, a little bit more. So I'm gonna pass quickly here. So we are working with in the two experiments that have the crop rotation component, uh, Northwest Research, the Hoytville, which is a clay loam, and also in Worcester, uh, which is a silt loam. And they both have the three tillage systems, no-till, chisel, and moldboard. Uh, so it's uh, increasing intensity of tillage. And also within the three tillage systems, we have three crop rotations. So continuous corn, corn soybean, and corn forage forage. And let's start looking at some results. So I'm gonna show these results that are from soil physical properties from another paper that was published recently. And it's also evaluating more than 50 years of those treatments. Here specifically, I'm gonna focus just on no-till and plow-till, so the more intense and the less intense tillage system. Uh, in these two sites, so in the left, Hoytville, the clay loam, and in the right, the silt loam. And we can see that in both, both sites, we have greater, uh, and the variable that we are measuring here is uh, penetration resistance, which is a proxy for soil density or soil compaction. I don't like to use soil compaction too much because there will be more resistance, but the compaction will happen up to a certain point of this uh, scale that we are gonna sh see here. So, we could see that after those 50 years, we, in the first eight inches or so, we have greater penetration resistance in no-till systems. And that makes a lot of sense because we are not plowing the soil and plowing is one of the factors that can help us alleviate the, uh, the density in that top layer. But one interesting result that we saw is that in Worcester, in the silt loam, and this below the plow layer, it starts getting really dense. And to a point that uh, goes beyond the, uh, what will be a penetration resistance that roots can grow, that water can infiltrate easily. Uh, here, more than two megapascals in this unit of measurement. So we could see that we have a greater resistance of the soil or, or a greater density of the soil in no-till systems but they don't reach a level that compromise the root growth. So there is greater resistance, there's greater compaction, but not to extend that will limit root growth. Uh, and later we'll see the crop yields. We already saw some of that and with that we can play. Well, it's, is it worth having this uh, greater resistance? It, is it impacting? And over time, this was in uh, June and May, but over time the changes, uh, they got closer to each other, but it's still the trends kept very similar to that. Uh, and does the stratification matter for soil and carbon? We already saw that there is a, when we, not, when we don't do any tillage on the soil, there's a greater concentration of soil organic matter. 
and that has implications such as when we sample the soil, for example, if we sample down to 2.5 inches, 0 to 5 or 0 to 10, we'll basically dilute the carbon concentration because if we get in the top surface, we'll have more carbon concentration uh, than if we get a deeper uh, soil layer when we are sampling soil. But to look a little bit more closely, how the distribution was happening. So this graph is a little bit, lots of points, I know, but let's go quickly here. So we have the three, uh, we're gonna see first the clay loam in Hartville and then later the Worcester site, but they both are organized in the same way. So we have moldboard to the left, chisel in the middle and no tillage to the right. And within them, we have the three crop rotations. So black points are continuous crop, uh, the gray uh, squares are crop soybean and the diamonds, the white diamonds are crop forge forge, so the more complex rotation. And we could see that these dashed lines here, they indicate the average over all depths. We could see that the average, if we compare down to uh, 12 inches, they don't change too much when we compare the, the, the three systems down to this di the deep, sorry, depth. And, uh, but we can see the pattern of the distribution of the organic carbon, in this case organic matter, that we have a greater concentration as Dr. Warren Dick showed in the previous slide. And we couldn't see in this specific site any effect of crop rotation. They look very similar across the three tillage systems. So in that site, in a clay, with, uh, site with more clay, there's not too much effect of crop diversity. But when we went to Worcester, we started seeing the same pattern of stratification, so less tillage, more stratified soils, but we started seeing some effects of crop diversity. So when we increase the diversity by using, um, in this case, corn, alfalfa, alfalfa, and some other cover crops, we saw that there is an enhancement of carbon in deeper layers of the soil. And that's something interesting when we think about ah, if there's a drought uh, or if there's too much water, the roots can grow deeper and they can take advantage of greater carbon concentrations uh, in deeper soil layers. So this is one effect that we could see. Uh, going towards the end here, uh, we also looked at some chemical properties. I'm gonna focus just on the potassium here. And we could see that the th there's also uh, a stratification, greater stratification in no tillage when compared to chisel or moldboard. But there's also a uh, effect of crop rotation. So when we have greater diversity, uh, we can see that there is this distribution of points here on the corn forage forward forage rotation, that it's enhancing the potassium concentrations in the top layers and down to uh, four or five inches. And that's an effect that it's benefiting the system because we have greater concentrations. And if we plant corn after that rotation, there will be a greater concentration so the corn can use those nutrients. Uh, we can see the size of the distribution. And when we, can, when we go to more intensive tillage, we basically, we lose this effect of crop rotation. It doesn't matter too much because uh, we are just uh, tilling the soil and mobilizing that, uh, that layer. So what can we take from, the, from all this? I know it's a lot of results, but uh, no tillage will allow greater soil organic matter and nutrient accumulation in the uppermost soil layer. So we, we think ecologically that will benefit crop roots that place their roots in those first couple inches or so, but it will also benefit the organisms that are in the soil because they will be mostly in that layer and they use organic matter to, uh, to nourish themselves. And if we think that, how can we use that in advantage of uh, an agricultural system? That can help us enhance nutrient cycling and increase nutrient use efficiency because we will be losing less nutrients by leaching that there are some uh, backlash such as runoff of phosphorus, but in general, if we have a, a system that it's working, we have greater nutrient concentrations there, we can use uh, each unit of nutrient in a greater way to produce more uh, food over time. 
And uh, we see that crop diversity has a greater effect in no tillage system. So when we start uh, tilling the soil too much, we lose some of the benefits that we can get with greater crop diversity. So with that, I'm going to uh, pass to Steve. Uh, I think we can do questions yeah. at the end or now. Yeah, yeah thanks, Leo. We'll, we'll save questions for the end, just in the interest of time. Okay. Thanks. OK, what I have for you folks is um, <clears throat> Admittedly, uh, the early stages of trying to figure out, and you know, Warren uh, just provided a, a nice overview and some of the yield data, especially in the earlier phases. But uh, there's a lot to unpack here, and uh, we haven't gotten there in terms of everything. But Warren, the last time you did a kind of thorough yield analysis was like in the early '80s, right? Yeah. 2000 or so, yeah. So it's been probably close to 20 years. And um, for this, uh, I, we have not included any, because 2019 was such a miserable year, uh, and we actually weren't able to harvest all of the crops. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm lo I've lopped off um, 2019. So really what we're talking about is 56 to 57 years of, of yield data, okay? There's a lot of questions that we can address and you know, of course, thinking about like what Leo just shared with us and this idea of stratification, how stratification actually impacts, right? So one of the things, you know, it's nice to kind of observe and document what's actually happening in the soil from, from the, the, the sake of a soil science perspective. There's a lot of growers that, you know, just want to know. Okay, so stratification happens, so uh, how does that affect my management or what are we actually, um, you know, what are we supposed to kind of do with that, right? Are we supposed to, to, to do things differently than we would do in a kind of a, a system that would be more disturbed or more uh, conventional tillage? So this is uh, yield data and uh, I'm just focusing in the interest of time on a couple relatively simple questions, which is, which treatments yielded best across all years, uh, which rotation and which tillage, and uh, which treatments, I think, perhaps a much more interesting question and, you know, the value of the data set that we have is which treatments are bringing the most yield benefits over time. So Warren, we, we did not talk about this ahead of time, but it actually set this up quite nicely in terms of thinking about this. So another way to ask this question is like, what is the rate of change in yields over time? Okay, so, and uh, again, there's a lot of data, but we'll just um, jump into, and I'm using uh, Northwest, I'll use Northwest instead of Hoytville. That is the same site. That is that heavy clay soil in Wood County, right? And so, ba-dum, ba-dum, bing, uh, it's beautiful, right? Uh, <clears throat> we've got, um, might we just take a step back and say, this is a lot of stinking work to collect 56 years to go out. This is, you know, replicated data, corn harvested every year. Um, and you can see there's, shockingly, uh, there are great year-to-year -year differences in corn yields. I, I, I'm not sure if uh, that was um, apparent or not, but we, we certainly have evidence of that. So. Uh, we've got, we're looking at the continuous corn, the corn soybean, the corn forage, forage, the plow, the conventional till, the no-till, that's how these plots will essentially be laid out, okay? And so it's like, what do you do with this? Like how, you know, it's like, how do we actually do this comparison? There's a lot, again, a lot to unpack here. Well, what, one of the things that we did is we just fit a line through it, okay? So we can look at, uh, we see there's a tremendous amount of year-to-year -year variability, and there's devil, a lot of devil in those details, and there's a lot of good information in that. But again, for this, this is a bit of a 5,000-foot overview as we kind of take this, you know, close to 60 years and start to dive in. And what I did uh, is take, so these lines, of course, are different. You cannot see that. But the slope is different. And I'd argue that the slope and the position, you know, in terms of how many bushels per acre that they've yielded over time is important. So I'm going to show you a slide right now, which is that. And these have three 
lines on it. And all I've done is taken these three respective lines based on the tillages and collapsed them into a single panel across our three rotations of continuous corn, corn soybean, and corn forage forage. Okay, so that's like, you know, from a grower perspective, it's like, well, can we, can we afford or can we think about waiting for 56 years to get an answer? But there's a, I, I find this way of showing this uh, pretty interesting because you can see a number of things here. You can see that, like Warren mentioned, sometimes the no-till started off relatively miserable compared to the till treatments. This was particularly relevant with the continuous corn in at the northwest site, okay? And what, what's also interesting is what happens over time. So we can look at the starting point, for example, and compare those treatments. We can look at the end point and compare those treatments, and then we can look at the slope of that line, and those numbers up there are essentially the slope. It's a bushel measurement per year. So in other words, if we look at the corn forage forage, we can see um, they didn't start off too far from each other in terms of the yield differences. The mole bore plow increased about 1.2 bushels of corn per year over those close to 60 years. The chisel till or conventional till um, <coughs> Increase 1.3, and then the and then the the no-till 1.4. So it's not just about you know the luxury of a, a large data set like this. It's not just about where we started and where we ended, but what happened you know over the course of that time to get there. Okay, does this make sense? Any questions on this? Yes, Warren. Yeah, one of the things important to show that this is over 60 years, so we're looking at an increase in total bushel per acre of about. 70 bushel per acre from the start mm -hmm. to where we are now. So that's, a, you know, a lot of things went into that. So 70 bushel per acre over that experiment increase. Mm -hmm. And that's, for the sake of corn, that's primarily due to increased genetics and increased plant density, right? That's, that's what's driving a lot of that. Weed so Because early years, weed control was really hard because they were just learning how to do no tillage back in the Right. Summer. So better overall agronomics, right? It's not just about genetics. It's agronomics. It's weed control. It's a, a lot of things going into this. But, we, you know, yields have been going up over time. That's a good thing. We, we, Is we're, that showing us that if it takes a few years, no till will win in the end? <laughs> Good question. So the question is, you know, is this a race and is no-till winning and uh, what's happening? So I'll leave that. I don't have a, a perfect answer for that. I'll be a little bit, uh, there's a lot of, you know, you look at what's going on and I'll show kind of a summary of this at the end and we can kind of compare what's happening over time. But yeah, certainly, you know, in the case, not a lot of continuous corn in the state, hardly any of it, but in case we wanted to do it, you know, it looks like um, we're, at 60 years, no-till and, and mobile plow are, are, are closing in on each other. Well, yes, sir. Yeah, would it take 30 years for me to lose money in order to get to Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. You can lose money fast or you can lose money real slow. It's up to you. Yeah. Too much. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, the, the other interesting thing is that your bushels per year are the same on the continuous corn versus the corn soybean rotation. Mm-hmm. Bushels, the rate of increase is the same. Okay, so this is one site. We, of course, this is the Northwest, or the Hoyville site. We've got another site, Worcester Corn, I'm gonna show you now. Okay, looks kind of similar. It's, it's different data, of course. Gonna do the exact same thing as take these yields, or the, 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 these best fit lines, recognizing, again, there's a lot of variability around these lines, and there's good information in that. We're not even going to attempt to unpack that today, okay? But there's needs to, we need to dig into that quite a bit more. <clears throat> and showing you the exact same thing when we collapse it, look across rotation, and then tillages within each block, okay? So again, we can look at the starting point. We can look at the end point. We can see over time, just like at Northwest, at this Worcester site, the, the yield winner here, especially if we look at the later years, is going to be you know when there's a forage in that rotation, right? So um, a lot there's it's a typically historically has been a, a grass forage um, a forage grass sorry a legume grass mix, um, but again 
Uh, at the Worcester site, Warren mentioned that no-till started much better than Northwest in the early years. And then as that's evolved, in some cases, is done not as good, right? Uh, and we know, if we're familiar with the experiment, that that Worcester site could benefit from some drainage. Uh, it's not a particularly well-drained, even though it's a silt loam soil, it's not particularly that well-drained a soil. If we could go back in time and repeat it, we might you know, be interested to see if we, we did install tile. Um, it's, it's untiled now, but if we did manage that drainage a little better, you know, the results might be quite, quite a bit different than what we're seeing here. Sir. Are your practices at either Wooster or the other place With a cover crop or not? There's no cover crops in, in with this. Yep. You know, one of the problems at Worcester we had over the years, not so much at Whiteville, is the no tillage corn. Uh, we had some years the slugs just decimated mm. us on the, on the no tillage corn. Mm. We, we, we went out one year and we put out a nematicide or a slug site, I guess you could call it. And there, there was every single corn plant, which was about six to Yeah. It was terrible. And we didn't see that Northwest. So a lot of cha you know, challenges with slugs, yeah, of course. So this, yep. this is experimental data. It's not exactly. Yep. OK. And then um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you those last two graphs together. Maybe it's a little too small to really see. But I just wanted to compare the site differences. <clears throat> um, in general, you know, especially for the kind of the, maybe the most recent 10 years or, or even 20 years, Increasing crop rotation, increased yield, right? And that's not, that's not a big surprise. We've seen that with lots of long-term trials over and over again. This is why we rotate crops, why we advocate that. Uh, plow had the lowest rate of yield gains, typically. Uh, and no-till typically had the highest in most of the rotations. Not all the rotations, but you know, again, we're for this, the sake of comparison. OK, so this is corn. And I'm just going to show you a little bit of soybean data before I, I uh, scurry off the stage here. Um, so Northwest soybean, again, uh, we don't have this two factorial with soybeans because we don't have the crop rotation. Soybeans are only present in that corn soybean rotation. Um, and so it's a, a simplified data. So we've got just the three for, uh, soybeans are represented in these experiments every year, but we just have the three tillages, okay? Again, we can do the same thing of, of uh, putting these lines together and then looking at where, where we're at. And so again, Northwest soybeans were particularly not very good in the earlier part of the year. But look at that rate of change over time. You know, there's 0.6 bushels per year uh, relative to something like uh, 0.3 bushels. So it's basically the rate gain over time. And there's a lot of, again, a lot of details in here, right? So maybe management got better. Maybe uh, genetics got better, control got better. But I would say that at least some of this, uh, and tell me if I'm wrong if you don't believe me, but some of that uh, slope, that better slope in the no-till is because those soils are building up and we're getting you know, better structured soil and highly healthier, more highly functioning soils, okay? I'm gonna do the same thing with Worcester soybeans. Our slopes, and here they are. Um, and this one uh, is, you know, not really the same story as we see in, in Hoytville in some ways because no-till started off uh, essentially better and the rate of change isn't too different between these three tillage treatments. So again, I'm not, I, I don't really particularly know what to make of this except it's, you know, it's the data that we have and this is a law of averages in many ways with, you know, dealing the, with this approach, okay? So we can combine those and kind of compare and contrast the two sites with soybeans. And uh, you know, major take homes is that uh, in earlier years, no-till yielded low in Northwest, but high in Worcester. In recent years, uh, no-till uh, has been high in Northwest with greater yield gains. And um, for the no-till in Worcester, it seems relatively similar to the, the chisel till treatment, okay? so. Soil type matters, uh, site specifics matter, how, how it's been managed, all these things you know, play into it. And I think it's a little bit disingenuous to think that we can take, even though this is an incredible data set, right? 
and it's a huge public investment in terms of documenting this, to think that we can take this and have some definitive story about if no-till is better than you know, this or that. Um, we know it, this helps us understand how no-till works and what the economic implications, but there's a lot of details that go into showing what's happening with yields over time. Um, for the sake, uh, well, you're not going to be able to process this, but uh, here it is uh, in case you're interested. It's just overall year, it's just like the average, uh, it's the average yield uh, by the, the tillages across um, the three crops. There's, of course, forage yields uh, in here. We haven't shown any of that data. And I'll just say, I'll just end by saying some other key questions about, um, you know, we've done a little bit of this analysis, Warren, as well, looking at wet years versus uh, dry years and how the different tillages or the rotations impact that. We believe that no-till, we've got evidence to show this, that no-till and crop diversity uh, provides a buffering of sorts, so it provides uh, less, you know, we don't get the giant yield shifts in when we're, uh, we have very droughty summers or very wet springs, for example. Um, we haven't even talked about profitability, so that's a, another, you know, can of worms that we could open and looking at what it costs to these various production systems. And then um, why, you know, the why. Why, are, why is this happening? You know, Leonardo talked a little bit about the stratification. And then uh, I'm going to bring up Dr. Christine Sprunger right now just to talk about roots and, and some of the, root, the role that roots play. It's a very interesting time to be a soil scientist right now. You may not know, but there's a lot of good information that we're really starting to better understand how carbon is formed, stored, protected, and preserved in the soil. So with that, I will uh, hand this over to Christine. Great, thank you. I know we're getting close to the lunch hour, but I was picked to go last because my talk's the shortest, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, so my name is Dr. Christine Sprunger. I'm an assistant professor of soil science and rhizosphere processes at OSU. And that last part of my title is really important. Rhizosphere processes means that I'm expected to think about the roots and also the microorganisms in the soil and how that contributes to agronomic performance, but also uh, soil health. And, you know, 10 years ago, this position would not have existed because we didn't really understand the important role that roots play in um, our agricultural systems. So there is kind of a misconception that uh, soil organic matter is driven mainly by above ground biomass. And over the past few years, we've actually realized that roots are indeed more important in terms of building soil carbon. And the reason for this is that roots um, turn over very quickly. They add a lot of nutrients into the soil through decomposition, and um, they just are, create a huge source of carbon. Um, it used to be uh, thought that roots only turned over once per year. Sometimes in natural systems it was thought that roots lasted longer than a year, but we realized that actually roots are continuously turning over within a growing season, and that's adding a lot of carbon and nitrogen into the system. And so with this recognition, there's actually a strong connection between roots and building soil organic matter. Um, there was a really great study performed in uh, China that looked at 6,000 sites uh, across grasslands, across uh, shrubland, and across forest systems. And what they found was that root biomass was the single most important factor in building soil organic matter. It wasn't temperature, it wasn't climate, it wasn't above ground biomass, it was root production. We've also found that it's not just root quantity that builds soil organic matter, but it's also that carbon derived from roots actually persists longer in the soil, uh, two and a half times more so than above ground uh, carbon. So this shows that's really important not only for building our pools, but also stabilizing carbon in the soil for long-term uh, soil sustainability. But we still, there are still a lot of unknown facts about roots. One of those is, you know, which crops uh, have the capacity to build soil carbon? 
through their roots. Um, another is how does management influence root production and soil health? We actually have very little data on how tillage and different crop rotations influences root production. And we also don't have a really strong understanding of how long it takes to detect changes in, in soil carbon and soil health based on root production. So those are some of the questions that um, my grad students and I are asking. So um, one, you know, this past growing season was not the best year for me to have my first growing season here at Ohio State University, um, but we're really excited to, to get into these no-till plots and really start asking questions about roots, about some of these other soil health indicators. And again, we're really interested in this tillage factor of how that influences root production as well as um, the crop rotational diversity. And as many of you might know, measuring roots is actually really challenging and that's why a lot of people don't do it. Um, so the way that we measured fine roots was we used in-growth cores um, and all this means is we went out to both Worcester and Hoytville. I don't know what that sound is. Um, and we took a core um, 10 days after germination and it, right in the field, we sieved that core and then added 30% sand to the mixture and then added um, in these mesh, whoops, in these mesh cores um, and then installed those cores in the root zone down to 15 centimeters. And then we just let it sit throughout the course of the growing season. And then right before harvest, we removed the cores and were able to obtain the annual fine root production from that current growing season. And so what did we find in terms of root biomass? We actually saw that a significant tillage effect as well as a significant rotational diversity effect. Um, here we were only comparing the chisel versus the no-till. And if you average the, um, the chisel and no-till values, we actually see greater fine root production under no-till, which is kind of what Leo and Steve were referring to earlier. And we definitely see this in Worcester. And just these low values at the Worcester site is just reflective of what a poor growing season we actually had. But even with a really poor growing season, we see that we have greater fine root production, which indicates greater productivity overall in that no-till system. So showing that you know, no-till, even in a really bad year, leads to greater production. And then we also see elevated levels, actually, in the corn alfalfa rotation. Um, but we really see it stand out um, in the more disturbed chisel plow system uh, in the, at the Northwest site. So what does this mean for soil health indicators? Um, You've probably gone to a lot of talks over the past couple of days that have talked about soil health. Everyone has a different, different definition for soil health. Um, but what we've started to do at um, OSU is think about different ways that we can actually quantify soil health. So some of our favorite measures um, that we use to look at soil health are respiration, which basically is measuring the microbial activity and also reflects how large the soil carbon pool is. Then we have this active carbon pool, um, which is largely correlated with soil organic matter. It's shown to be a little bit more, sta a stable, more stable pool of carbon. And then we have soil protein, which reflects the available organic pool of nitrogen. And so again, what we see um, in terms of respiration is a significant uh, tillage and crop rotational diversity effect. Um, and it really shows especially in that elevated levels within the corn alfalfa alfalfa rotation. And again, this just kind of pinpoints the, the importance of having a perennial in our rotation. In terms of active carbon, again, this is a, a soil health indicator that reflects more of um, the larger soil organic matter pool. 
the um, differences aren't as great as respiration because respiration is such a sensitive test to um, differences in management, but we still see those elevated levels in the corn alfalfa, alfalfa rotation, which is really encouraging. And then in terms of soil protein, again, um, it's really the rotational diversity that stands out here, where we have elevated levels um, in that corn alfalfa, alfalfa rotation. And so what this is showing is that, you know, these fine roots um, are feeding the soils and definitely contributing to increases in soil um, health indicators over time, and it really jumps out in the uh, rotational diversity. And so um, just to briefly summarize this, roots are really key contributors to soil organic matter, um, but we really see it most when we have a perennial present in the rotation. It could be because it just added uh, nitrogen, greater nutrients overall. Um, but what was most important, I think, is even in a really bad year, we did see that no-till seems to win in the end. Um, and, you know, just again, if you're interested in, in thinking about how to increase soil health, um, including a perennial is usually a safe bet. Um, and I just want to end by talking about a study that we're going to be doing um, this growing season in 2020. Um, we're actually wanting to look at several of these soil health indicators on different farmer fields. We're really interested in how different management practices influence soil health. We're really interested in um, understanding how soil health indicators can be useful in variable weather. Um, so if there are farmers or growers in the room or extension educators that, that know farmers that might be interested in participating, um, please let us know. I have pamphlets in the back. Um, but really, we're uh, just looking for, for participants. Um, one thing that I'll, I'll say is that we have a lot of data from these long-term trials. We want to be able to translate to actual farmer fields, and so starting to do more on farm research will, will help us. Be able to